Well, my name is Tyler LeBaron, and I'm here at SotMed. I have the opportunity to speak on molecular hydrogen. Um, hydrogen gas, which is a very amazing molecule for its therapeutic applications. And I, my background is biochemistry and physiology, and so I'm not an ozone expert by any means. I, I, I'm not a medical doctor. I don't treat patients, so I don't claim to be an expert in the ozone. But there are some principles of molecular biology and biochemistry that uh, maybe apply to ozone, and so I was asked to just give my thoughts about ozone in general, as well as uh, maybe a, a synergistic or additive effect or complementary effect with the molecular hydrogen administration. Um, for, first off, uh, I want to just give a little bit of background about molecular hydrogen in general. So we are talking about hydrogen gas, which is a gas. It's H2. It's the small molecule, smallest molecule in the universe, actually. And it's neutral. It's hydrophobic. And it can easily go through the cells into the mitochondria, the nucleus, everywhere, anywhere, very easily. And this has been shown in, in, in many publications, hundreds of publications, um, showing the therapeutic effects with its anti-inflammatory actions, its antioxidant-like effects, um, regulating many uh, transcription factors because it really behaves as a modulator of signal transduction. And the way that molecular hydrogen does this is still remains elusive, much like ozone, actually. We're still trying to figure out the exact pathways. But ozone's a little bit more clear because we know it's a very oxidative molecule. It can oxidize dis uh, disulfide bonds in other areas to release, like, KEEP1, for example. Then uh, NRF2 goes in and activates uh, the gene expression for antioxidant enzymes. Molecular hydrogen is, is interesting because it's, it's, it's neutral, so it's rather uh, un non reactive. Um, and if it's, it's explosive, yes, but you have to light a match and have the presence of oxygen and then it can blow up and now you have the Hindenburg. But when we use it therapeutically, we, we, you inhale about a less than 4.6% concentration, maybe 2 to 3% concentration. Above a 4.6% concentration, it becomes flammable. And the Japanese government recently approved the inhalation of hydrogen gas for the treatment of post-cardiac arrest syndrome because it's been shown to be basically just as effective, if not more effective, at least in the animal studies and suggestive of the preliminary studies, to be as effective as hypothermia, which is the conventional treatment. So, anyways, going back to the, uh, the, the ozone idea, the way ozone may work is kind of like hormesis. For example, exercise. We, we breathe a lot more oxygen, we create a lot more free radicals, and these free radicals have good effects and bad effects. And these, these free radicals can uh, damage DNA and RNA, protein, cell membranes, and can cause lots of damage. But by so doing, they, they also induce uh, the transcription of, like I said, the NRF2 induces the transcription of, say, glutathione, superoxide dismutase, catalase, induction of heme 1 oxygenase. All these are very cytoprotective proteins and enzymes that are our body's natural uh, endogenous antioxidant self-defense system. And so when we, we exercise, we can upregulate our body's uh, phase two detoxification enzymes and, and many other benefits, mitochondrial biogenesis, etc. So o ozone would work in a similar pathway. Um, ozone you know, is quite reactive. It's a ra rather strong oxidizing agent. And so its, it's half-life is not going to be very long, especially in the body, because it's going to react quite quickly. And it, when it does so, it would probably go through a series of reactions um, and increasing the reaction of hydrogen peroxide and then a propagation series. So probably when you administer it, the ozone molecule itself has, has reacted quite quickly and then forms propagation steps and then that continues to react and then all that leads to a mild a hormesis. Well, mild, but really it depends on the dose being administered. So we, we should see um, some things dose dependent. At least the oxidative effects would be dose dependent, maybe not the therapeutic effects. So there's probably a line where so much of it is, uh, is more effective than a lower amount, but then eventually it's kind of logarithmic and, and those benefits weigh off whereas you continue increasing the dose, then you start running the risk of um, inducing a serious oxidative damage because, of course, ozone, that's how you kill bacteria, you kill, you know, our body uses that. Um, so too much oxidative stress, just like an ischemia perfusion injury, can certainly be damaging. And so if you're going to do a, a heavy load of oxidative uh, stress through, through ozone therapy, um, you probably have to be cautious that first the body is ready to handle that. You know, they, they, they haven't been doing lots of heavy bouts of strong oxidative stress, you know, uh, recently. Maybe give them a little bit of break. 
um, before they before they go in it again. Um, doing the micro doses, you know, intermittent. We know intermittent exposure, the pulse effect is extremely important. And then it just depends on, on the individual and on, on the disease that you're looking at and where it's being administered and how it's being administered for how long and, and the timing, how much of the dose are you administering within that uh, section of time. All of those will need to be looked at. But, but hydrogen gas may be able to be beneficial because hydrogen gas is, is we typically in, in, in organic chemistry, for example, example, consider hydrogen gas as a reducing agent. Um, because it has the two electrons that can donate and things. But in all reality, molecular hydrogen in the body exerts more as a mild peroxidant effect. And, and it can react with some radicals if, if they are around. For example, the hydroxyl radical, which is the most damaging reactive oxygen species, because it's just so reactive. Hydrogen gas could react with the hydroxyl radical. And, and there's some preliminary data to suggest that perhaps it can also react with peroxyl nitrite or, or reduce that. And that's very critical because ozone, as, as part of the byproducts, the byproducts of ozone is you can have increased hydroxyl radicals and peroxyl nitrite, which is just really, really bad. We want to get rid of that. And hydrogen gas can help mitigate and attenuate um, both maybe their production as well as um, it, it, their, their damage. So it may be a wise idea to do a pretreatment of hydrogen gas. So you could do administer hydrogen gas uh, at least several hours before because you have to go through you know, uh, a signal modulation. And so in, in the studies, you know, we can see an effect within three hours or so. So at least a, f a few hours before, maybe even a few days before, uh, say they could just simply drink hydrogen-rich water, do some inhalation. And then that way you have a good pretreatment, and then you administer your, 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 even your heavy bouts of ozone, and you do the same therapy. And now ozone would really kick the, the whole body into that hyperactivation, but you'd be able to potentially mitigate some of those toxic effects. There was a symposium I attended uh, in, in Japan uh, last year, and there was actually a combination of using ozone uh, therapy and, and hydrogen. Um, the, the, pub, the study's not published, it's preliminary data, but it was suggested that when the two are used together, you had a, an additive or potentially a synergistic effect. Now, you could administer hydrogen gas with the ozone um, concomitantly, which is okay because uh, ozone and hydrogen gas are not going to react. Um, it's, the, the ozone is not a powerful uh, oxidizer and hydrogen gas is not a, a powerful enough uh, reducing agent. The activation energy is too high. So you could do that together. Um, but again, uh, the issue is hydrogen gas maybe have better to be administered previously because it m works more as a signal modulator as opposed to a uh, direct radical scavenger because it, it it's not strong enough to really react with anything except the hydroxyl radical, which that half-life is so, so fast that it doesn't really exist um, in, in that paradigm. But so, so you could do a pretreatment, then you could do concomitant if you wanted to, and then you could follow up with some post-treatments. But the intermittent exposure is probably the most important thing to consider. And then you can play around with the doses of hydrogen. Hydrogen is extremely safe. Um, they use it in deep sea diving to prevent decompression sickness since the 1940s at literally millions of times higher concentrations than what we use for therapeutic use. So you could do very high doses of hydrogen gas. We, we excel it out very quickly. It's excelled from the body within 60 minutes or so. So you could go high concentrations and you could do your ozone therapy and just kind of play around and, and see how, how you feel is most benefiting your patients. It's difficult to go wrong because it is safe, but it's something that's worthwhile to look at. But we certainly need more studies. So thank you. When they hit the high dose, it's going to take away some of the negative effects that could occur from the ozone and yet allow the beneficial ones. Is that, is, am I saying that right? Yeah, I, that, that's what I would say. And we need more data to really right. confirm that, but the preliminary data in animal and human studies and using radiation toxicity, for example, would suggest that yes, taking the doses of hydrogen two or three days before, before you administer the ozone, could help negate some of the toxic effects of the ozone, be able to use potentially even higher doses of ozone so you can get a stronger effect without uh, the, the, the pernicious effects.